there is as much debate about the elders as there is the throne and who the person is that sits on the throne of Revelation 4 and 5. I want us to just go through these two chapters again. We'll not read every verse in these two chapters, but I want to take the verses especially where the elders are referred to. In order to do that, we'll begin with the first verse of chapter 4 again. The first reference to elders in these two chapters is in the fourth verse. Then the next reference is uh, verse 10. And then we go to the fifth chapter, and there are several references uh, to the elders in chapter 5. After these things I saw, and behold, a door has been opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. I will show you things which must occur after these things. Immediately I came into the sphere of inspiration. And behold, a throne was being set in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And the one sitting was in appearance like a jasper and carnelian and a carnelian stone, and a halo or radiance, whichever you want to use, around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne there were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones twenty-four elders sitting who have been clothed in white garments and on their heads golden crowns. Drop down to verse 10. The four and twenty elders shall fall down before the one sitting on the throne, and they shall worship the one living forever and ever, and shall cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, our... (coughs) Thou art worthy, our God, our Lord, uh, our Lord God, to receive the honor and the power because you created all things, and for the sake of your desire, they exist and were created. Now look at chapter 5. Drop down to verse 6. And one of the elders says to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, overcame to open the book and the seven seals of it. Drop down to verse eight, no, verse 6. Yes, there's reference to elders in verse 6. And I saw on the censer of the throne and among the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders a lamb having stood like a lamb that has been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God having been sent forth into all the earth. Verse 8. And when he took the book, well we need to read verse 7 to make the proper connection. And he came and has taken the book out of the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they are singing a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open its seals. 
For you were put to death, and you purchased to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you made them uh, to be our God, uh, to our God, a royalty and priest, and we shall reign. I'm translating this preposition, a P, over rather than own. Now, you can, you can wrestle with that yourself. Verse 11, And I saw and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and living and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Drop down to verse 14. And the four living creatures were saying, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped, period. The other, verses, the other words are not in uh, your Greek text. <clears throat> so our subject tonight is the subject of the elders. Who do the twenty-four elders represent? This is a debatable subject like everything else in Scripture. So we're going to look very carefully tonight at the subject of the elders. First of all, I'm going to have about, actually about six points in connection with our study of the elders. Number one, the elders of Revelation are human beings, not angels. The elders are human beings, not angels. Angels are never numbered in Scripture. Now notice why I'm saying what I have. But elders are numbered. Angels are never arrayed in white raiment or white garments as the elders are referred to as being clothed. White raiment in reference to men signifies the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the words for white raiment, meaning a garment or raiment, and we have the second word, which means bright, white, or light. Now, several references refer to Jesus Christ, and three refer to men. I want us to look at these. First of all, in Matthew 17, 2, and you'll recognize by the reference before I go any further, Mark 9, 3 and Luke 9, 3, all three of these references refer to the trout and the Mount of Transfiguration scene. So these three references referring to Christ are all related to the Mount of Transfiguration scene. And three of the references refer to men, to men. And uh, we're going to begin with Acts chapter 1 and verse 10. Now, if you haven't made a study of this before in your Christian life, this will be interesting to you. Acts chapter 1, verse 10. And as they were gazing, let's go back to verse 9 to get the proper connection. This refers to the ascension of our Lord. And having said these things, as they were looking, he was taken up, and a cloud received him from their sight. Or it could be removed him from their sight. Now verse 10, and as they were gazing intently toward heaven, as he was leaving, behold, two men. It doesn't say two angels, it says two men. Furthermore, I want you to look at your Greek text. The word here is andres, and this is the inflected form of the word arneir. 
which is the word used for men, different from anthropos. And it refers to an adult, mature individual. And that's the word that is used. It is not the word used for angels. It is the word used for man on air. All right, let's read all of verse 10 again and then look at verse 11. And as they were gazing intently toward heaven, as he was leaving, behold, two men had stood. Now let's stop there a moment. That's a pluperfect. Uh, are you familiar with the pluperfect in the Greek? Not used a whole lot, but it's used in places. When you think about the pluperfect, that is the perfect of past tense. I'm explaining it in that manner. In other words, it was not only completed in past time, it stops in past time. That's pluperfect. Pluperfect. Now, with that in mind, it's important to, to observe that. So let's look at verse 11 again. Who also said, uh, excuse me, back in verse 10. And as they were gazing intently toward heaven as he was leaving, behold, two men had stood, pluperfect, started and finished in past time, by them in white garments, who also said, You men of Galilee, why have you stood looking to the heaven, this Jesus, the one having been taken up from you to heaven, shall come in the same way you observed him going to the heaven. Now, were these two men angels? I've heard that, and you probably have too. It says they were men. Who were they? I want you to follow me in the study of elders tonight and the white garments and so forth. I'm doing this as an introduction. <clears throat> the word for men, when speaking of Moses and Elias or Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, is the same word for man that is used here in Acts 1 and verse 10. Same word. It is on air rather than anthropos. Now, the same Greek word is used. Now, get the outline here because we're going to talk not only about the death of Christ and their association with Christ's death, but the resurrection of Christ and their association with the resurrection, and thirdly, with the ascension of Christ, which we just read in Acts 1.10, and their relation to the ascension. On air is the word. Andres is the plural, but on air is the root word. So the same Greek word is used in Luke 9, 3 in connection with Christ's, and it's called in the King James, decease. Decease. And that is the Greek word which simply means departure. Metaphorically, a departure from life, decease, or death used in Luke 9.31 and 2 Peter 1.15. Now, in all probability, why, well, watch what I'm saying. You can be dogmatic about some things. You cannot be dogmatic about others. But put it together and see what you come up with. In all probability, the same two men are seen in Luke 24.3 and the theme is not crucifixion in that portion of Scripture, but Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrection. Now, I'm not dogmatic about this, but folks, don't write it off. Consider it. And I don't know of anything that will refute it, but I'm presenting something to you that you may not be acquainted with, so I'm saying... Listen carefully, weigh the evidence, and see who's right. Or I, don't want to, I want to go a step further. So the theme is not crucifixion in Luke 24 and verse 3, yet the same word is used. Two men are referred to. I'm of the opinion, folks, 
And I am of a strong opinion that the same two men spoken of in relation to his decease or his death are the same two that we hear about here in Luke 24 and verse 3. Finally, in Luke 25, is that in your Bible? Will you turn to Luke 25 for a moment? It's in mine. What do you mean by Luke 25? See, I'm catching you now. Acts 1. That's Luke 25. A former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. And Acts 1 is a continuation of Luke's work concerning the resurrection. So now we come to the ascension, not the resurrection. So finally, in Luke 25, and I hope it's in your Bible because it is in mine, otherwise entitled Acts 1. The former treatise, so this indicates Acts is a continuation of Luke 24. No one can argue with that. The two men that we just read about in Acts 1.10 are seen standing by as Christ ascended, and they spoke of what? His second coming. Isn't that wonderful? They were present at the ascension, and they spoke of the second coming. He'll come in like manners as you have seen him go. Now, check me out. Check me out. You have on air used in all these references two men. I call them two men. I don't call them two angels. It is an angelos. It's on air. On air. Now, I wouldn't spit hairs over this, but it's certainly worthy of our consideration. Now, redeemed saints. I'm getting back to our subject of the elders. Redeemed saints are clothed in white, as we're told from the two chapters that we have looked at, especially some verses in chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation, and enthroned. They were not only clothed in white, but enthroned. There were 24 thrones and 24 elders sitting on the 24 thrones. And in the midst of that throne, now you have the point. So looking at point number one, the elders of Revelation are human beings, not angels. I believe that. I believe it with all my heart. Now, secondly. The elders are not disembodied spirits, but glorified subjects of God's grace. That's point number two as we consider the subject of elders in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Now, we have another proof of this. The elders are redeemed, Revelation 5, 9, and 10. And then compare that with Revelation 1, 5, and 6. 1, 5, and 6. Man is not complete without a body, either in time or in eternity. I'm not going to get into our studies of eternity and time and about being clothed upon as soon as we step out of time and step into eternity, we're not going to be naked. We're not going to be spirits floating around. And 2 Corinthians 5 certainly proves the point beyond a shadow of a doubt. But I want to make this point here in the study of elders. So man is not complete without a body. So these elders had bodies. And that's not only in time, but also in eternity. There is no waiting in eternity. That, to me, is so simple. How can there be a waiting in eternity when there is no time in eternity? 
Since there's no time, then there's no waiting. You don't wait. You can't wait when there's no time. And folks, that's a wonderful thought, glorious thought. So there's no waiting in eternity because there can be no waiting when time does not exist. Waiting occurs only to those who are bound by time. Within the framework of time, resurrection is future. But to the dying saint, it is an immediate present. Now, unless a person is willing to study this subject, he'll have some problems with it. None in eternity will have to wait for their glorified body. You just step out of time, you step into eternity, you immediately have your glorified body. A body not made with hands eternal in the heavens, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4. So these elders are not disembodied spirits. We're studying the elders. And notice each step that we take. Number three, the elders are in their places before the Jews and Gentiles come out of the great tribulation. There's order in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 7, we have the conversion, that is, bringing in of the chosen Jews, a nation born in a day. We'll be studying uh, Romans 11 especially, Matthew 24 when we get to uh, Revelation chapter 6, and a lot of other portions of Scripture which we must study in connection with Revelation 6, the opening of the first seals, in order to bring it all together. So the elders are in their places. They're before the throne. And this is before the conversion, the bringing in of the Jews and also of the Gentiles, a multitude of Gentiles as we have in, in Revelation 7, out of every nation under heaven. So this is the fulfillment of Paul's discussion of Israel's future in Romans chapter 11. Number four. Instead of the elders anticipating the final results of the day of the Lord, they actually participate. This is an important point. They actually participate as associate judges in God's judicial acts upon the earth. And I want to read that to you. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll begin with the first verse, but especially verses 2 and 3. Now, I'm reading from the King James. I don't think that I have... No, I have, I have gone into this portion. I didn't know I had done it in this Bible. Let's begin with verse 1. Can any one of you, having a lawsuit against another, bring himself to be judged before the unjust and not before the saints? You see, when churches do what they are supposed to do under God and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, discipline will be exercised in the local churches. As I said last Sunday, where there is no discipline, there is no true church. It's just that simple. Now, Paul is having to rebuke the Corinthians for a number of things that were wrong in their lives. And this was one of them. They got something, they got, uh, got it in for somebody and they didn't like what somebody was doing or they loaned money and, and uh, they'd take a person, one Christian would take another Christian before unsaved people in order to judge the individual. Whereas Christians should judge all matters among themselves and bring a verdict 
And if a person is a Christian, he's willing to abide by biblical principles. I don't want to be judged by, by a jury made up of a bunch of uh, unregenerate people, do you? We may be judged one of these days by such a jury, but I don't want to be. Now notice what he says in verse 1. Can any one of you, having a lawsuit against another, bring himself to be judged before the unjust and not before the saints? That's simply stated, isn't it? After all, judgment begins at God's house. 1 Peter 4, 17. Now verse 2. Or, have you not known that the saints shall judge the world? Now we're getting to the point that I'm making. And this is talking about the world system, folks. You and I are going to judge the world system. Watch this. And if the world, and you need to add system in your interpretation of this, shall be judged by you if you are unworthy of insignificant judgments. Now look at verse 3. Have you not known that we shall judge angels? We're even going to judge angels. We're going to judge the world system. And under Jesus Christ, the supreme judge, we're going to judge the angels. Not to speak of things of this life. Now, what did I say? I said the elders are going to participate as associate judges in God's judicial acts upon the earth. There are those who believe the elders should be viewed anticipatively as they try as they triumph for Christ. And after the seals are broken, after the seven trumpets have sounded, I'm giving you what some say. And after the terrible time of judgment when the bowls of wrath would be poured out upon the earth, they overlook the fact that the elders occupy their thrones. Read it in chapters 4 and 5. We've already read it, but read it again. Study it closely and carefully. So they overlook the fact that the elders occupy their thrones while the book of God's purpose remained unopened. Therefore, the scene is judicial in character, and the elders are safe in heaven before the judgment. So the rapture has taken place. The translation has taken place. That means we're not going to go through the great tribulation. The Greek word for tribulation must be studied. Many places where it is used, it refers to ordinary tribulations that you and I endure in life. But the great tribulation, folks, we're going to be kept from it. That's what is described in the judgment when the seals are broken and God's wrath is poured out upon the earth. But the elders are safe. They're on their thrones. And we're going to see who they represent in a minute. Now we come. Just who do they represent? Here's where the big, big, big argument is today. The 24 elders are to be viewed as a representative number. Certainly we understand that. As a representative number. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament for a moment. There were elders in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word as well as the Greek word presbyteros is the word for elder. 
The primary meaning of elder, and let us never forget this, means an older, mature person. Folks, we are losing sight, and I'm not saying this because of my age today, but in America we're losing sight. I said we're losing sight of the value of older people and the wisdom which they have gained. Not only from study, but also from experience. Also from experience. So the 24 elders are to be viewed as a representative number. So there were elders in the Old Testament. But they differed from New Testament elders. I said they differed. They were appointed as assistants to Moses in the administration of civil affairs and in judicial functions. Don't forget, please, the nation of Israel, the assembly can't be compared, per se, with the nation of Israel. There were 12 tribes. When they moved from one place to another, there was one who was the head of each tribe. And they would move in unison. And when they stopped, the tabernacle would be set up. And there were certain ones who were responsible for erecting the tabernacle, which was portable, not like the temple that was a permanent fixture. So there was order. And there were elders. They were assistants to Moses. Now, New Testament elders are responsible primarily for spiritual matters. I said primarily for spiritual matters. There were many priests and Levites under the Mosaic economy. However, the representative number was 24. Let me give that to you. I'll prove it. First Chronicles 23, 3 and 4. And chapter 24, verses 3 through 5. That was a representative number. These were not human devices, but things specially directed by the Spirit of God. First Chronicles 18, 11 through 13, and then drop down to verse 19 and read those verses carefully. And meant to be, quote, figures of the true, Hebrews 9, 9, 23, and 24. After all, you know, Hebrews is a brief summary of God's dealings with Israel in the Old Testament. Now, let's enter into a little study and a discussion that does not always coincide between one person and another person concerning the elders at this point. There are those who do not believe they represent the assembly. So I'm telling you what you come up against when you start studying elders in theological works. They believe they are chief priests of the heavenly temple who own the Savior as their worthy Lord. Now, I don't believe this, but I'm giving you what they say. To them, the elders are the rulers of the angelic sons of God who kept their government and abode when others left. Jude verse 6 is their proof text. They are seen sitting while inferior angels stand. I'm quoting them. They are more privileged than those who stood before Solomon. 1 Kings 12 and verse 6. These elders, they say, were mysterious beings, not men. I said, they said. I didn't say it. I'm quoting. Now, let me give you some things they say. I gave you a subheading, and I'll give you some subheadings under that subheading. Number one under that, 
They say they are crowned before Christ appears. And they talk about Revelation 19. Number two, they say, they distinguish between themselves and those redeemed by Christ. And they quote Revelation 5, 10, 7, 14 through 17, and 11, verse 18. Three, their song is of the glory of of God in creation. Revelation 4.11 Number four. They say they offered before the Lamb the prayers of the saints. Number five. One elder asked about the multitude of Revelation 7.13. And then they say the church does not inquire about the church. They say, but the multitude is not the church. And finally, they say these elders complete their ministry when Christ comes again the second time, Revelation verse 19. The whole chapter of Revelation they use. Now, let's go a step further. Secondly, going back, those were subheadings under the subheading. Now here is the subheading again, another subheading. Some do not believe social and political elders of the Old Testament. And that's what they were primarily if you have made a study of the elders of the Old Testament, are combined with the spiritual elders of the New Testament. They say the old economy is typical of the new, and therefore fulfillment rather than addition must be understood. The first economy has given place to the second. So you can't combine the New Testament elders or 12 of them representing the assembly elders and 12 of them representing the Old Testament saints. And they're very dogmatic about that view. Now, number three, there are others who believe the elders represent not the angels. Secondly, not Israel. Not Israel and the church, they say. But the church slash state through the whole of it. So what I'm doing, folks, tonight. And if you follow me and you're taking some notes, fine. But if you're not, you need to get the tape. Because I'm giving you a skeleton that covers this from every point of view that I can think of. And you and I are going to have to make a decision as to about what is right and what is wrong. I'll give you another subheading before we get to the last point, and it's the juicy one. It's the summation and what I believe the Scriptures teach. The fourth subheading, finally, <clears throat> there are those who believe the elders represent the people of God from Adam to the last one saved before the rapture. <clears throat> no distinction is made between the bodies of the Old Testament saints and the bodies of the New Testament saints. And they refer to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18, when Christ comes, he comes for his own, they say. Now, it is true that Christ died for the elect of the Old Testament. All of the saints of God who died before the death of Christ, the death of the testator, according to Hebrews chapter 9, his death at Calvary certainly paid for the sins of all the Old Testament saints whose sins had been rolled forward year after year 
by the typical sacrifice that was offered by the high priest. And the proof of that, folks, is found in Romans 3, 24, 25, and 26. Now, so part of their statement is absolutely correct. He died for the elect of the Old Testament. And then we are to say, add to that, as well as the elect of the New Testament. Christ died for the elect, period. Now, <clears throat> what do we really believe about the elders of Revelation chapters 4 and 5. I'll tell you what I believe. The elders to me represent the people of God. I said the people of God from Adam to the rapture of the assembly that Christ is continuing to build. Paul made no distinction between the Old and New Testament saints when referring to those who were asleep at the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Now those of Matthew 27, 51 and 52 <clears throat> were a foretaste of of that which was to come. Have you ever wondered about that passage? Turn to Matthew 27. <clears throat> Let's read beginning with verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the Spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Now the next verse. <clears throat> and the graves were opened. Now this literally took place, folks, at the death of our Lord. And many bodies of the saints which slept, arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, you'd like for me to really take a long time to go into that, but folks, we'll do that when we get into prophecy later. <clears throat> but let's look at that passage. So those of Matthew 27... 51 and 52 were a foretaste of that which is to come. Now, I would like for you to study at this point during the week if you have time, Revelation 21, 12 and 14, Romans chapter 11, and also Galatians 6, 16. Now, what do we have? We come into the sixth and final point tonight. <clears throat> Redeemed human beings are crowned. I said redeemed human beings are crowned. And angels are not crowned. I said angels are not crowned. They worship the triune God. The elders were secure in eternity before Christ spoke in judgment, beginning with chapter 6, when the seals began to be opened. And judgment starts coming on the earth. All right, let's, let's read some verses again. In these two chapters, <clears throat> Revelation 4 and 5, especially chapter 5. I think we need to read the whole chapter. And then I'll give you several points that will take a little while to conclude with. 
So let's begin with verse 1 of chapter 5. <clears throat> and I saw on the right hand of the one sitting on the throne a book having been written within and on the back, having been sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a great voice, who is worthy, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? Who is worthy? The elders were representative of all the saints. I say both Old and New Testament saints in glory. They had on white robes and they were crowned. And none of them were worthy. Now, folks, if they didn't feel they were worthy and not one of them was worthy, what about us that are not even perfected yet, not even glorified? Do we have anything to brag about except the grace of God that's been bestowed upon us? What about these church members that just go around tooting their horn all the time? See what I'm talking about? I'm talking about biblical humility, folks. That's what I'm talking about. Biblical humility. All right, look at verse 3. And no one in the heaven, neither on earth, nor under the earth, was being able to open the book. Notice a step further they go. Neither to be looking on it. neither to be looking at it. Verse 5, And one of the elders says to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, overcame to open the book, and the seals, seven seals of it. And I saw on the censer of the throne, and among the four living creatures. Now you may wonder, who are these four living creatures? I'll have to give just a little bit on it. <clears throat> I believe they refer not to the angels, but to like the, the seraphim and the cherubim. And I'd like to give you some scriptures on this. First, let's look at the cherubim. The cherubim seem to be intermediaries between God and man. Now, take these scriptures down, please. Genesis 3, 24. Exodus 25, 18 through 20. Exodus chapter 26 and verse 1. Then I want you to study in connection with those verses the whole 10th chapter of Ezekiel. What do we see here? We see the cherubim in government. The cherubim in government. We see the seraphim in redemption. We see the cherubim connected with creation. We see the seraphim in worship. In worship. The living creatures. Now, we'll not go into that any further tonight. But you'll see a vital connection between Ezekiel and this in Revelation. Now, let's begin with verse 6 again. And I saw on the censer of the throne and among the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, a lamb having stood. Having stood. That's perfect tense. Then what else? Following that, like a lamb that 
has been slain. That's redemption, isn't it? Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, having been sent into all the earth. And he came and has taken the book out of the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders, so the cherubim, the seraphim, and the elders fell down before the Lamb, each one having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they are singing a new song. What a song, folks. A new song. Saying, you are worthy to take the book. Who's worthy to take the book? The Lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the divine trinity. To take the book and to open its seals. And you were put to death. Who is it? Any doubt in your mind? It's Christ, the second person of the Godhead. That's why he assumed a human body. A sinless human body in order that he might die. God absolutely considered cannot die. You redeemed, we could say you purchased. And what do we have here? That's the verb agarazzo. To God, by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now I want to stop there a moment. Let me insert something at this point. How many of you, you remember Ray Summers? You went to Baylor. He taught at Baylor a long time. Taught Greek and I don't know what else. Let me give you an outline by Ray Summers from his book on Worthy is the Lamb. Let me give it to you. Here it is. This redemptive work is, number one, for God, Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. Secondly, through Christ's blood, number three, unlimited, what did I say? Unlimited. Is Mr. Summers right? If it's unlimited, then he died in vain for a lot of people. And listen to the fourth step of his outline. Makes the redeemed a kingdom to serve Christ on earth. There is his amillennialism. That's his comment on this ninth verse. Now look at verse 10. And you made them to our God a royalty or a kingdom or royalty and priest and we shall reign. Now epi is the genitive of place. And you have to make up your mind just how to translate this preposition, which is the genitive of place. And that's what it is. No one can argue with that, but you're going to have to make up your mind how to translate it. Whether it's on the earth, well, that's true, but over the earth. Well, folks, what he has made us, we're going to reign with Christ. We're heirs and joint heirs with Christ. When he reigns, we're going to reign with him. 
He has made us a royalty, a kingdom, and priest. And we shall reign. Where? What about those who say there is not going to be a kingdom on this earth? Folks, this is, this is the scripture I'm reading. Where is it going to be? Right here on the earth. Not as it is now, but after its purification. I said, after its purification. And that takes you to 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 12 forward. Now, let's read a little further. Then in verse 11 he says, And I saw and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads. You want to know how many that is? Well, get your dictionary and look it up. <laughs> and what else? He didn't stop there. And thousands of thousands, innumerable from your point of view and mine. <laughs> All right, verse 12. Sing with a great voice. Folks, there's not much unity here, and you can't, you can't demand that people be united. I'm not going to demand that you be united. I'd be wasting my breath. We're united because of the grace of God in us and our understanding of the Scriptures. That's what unites us. I said, that's what unites us. You can't command people to be united. We are united. We're welded together with truth. So he says, saying with a great voice, Worthy is the Lamb who has been slain. To receive the power. Notice the things mentioned here. Power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. And who's worthy of those things? Not man. Only Jesus Christ himself. In whom the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. Now, verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and beneath or under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and dominion to the one sitting on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever, or for eternity. Folks, I'm not looking forward to the time when you and I are with the Lord, then I'm going to come over to your place, wherever you are, <laughs> and sit down and talk about all the good times and bad times that we had on earth. I love my wife dearly, but I want you to know, once we are with the Lord, this relationship that exists on earth will not exist then. Does that disturb any of you? I'm not going to be thinking about gathering all of you around and we'll just have a big old time reminiscing. That's humanistic to the core. People who have that concept of heaven, they need to do some second and third thinking, I think. Don't you? All right, look at this. Verse 14. And the four living creatures were saying, and the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped. Worship, period. Nothing else. That's it. Now I want to ask you a question. 
Looking at chapters 4 and 5, where were the elders? They were representative of the people of God, having been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And before the sixth chapter, before the opening of the first seal, all the Old Testament saints and all the New Testament saints who have died in Christ, constituting the bride of Christ, we are all safely in heaven before the judgment ever starts. Now the question is, is that biblical? Well, let's go through the Scriptures. Would you go through the Scriptures with me? Let me give you some things to prove it. What about Enoch? Enoch was translated before the flood. Enoch's translation before the flood certainly foreshadows the translation of you and me if Christ comes before we die. Before that awful judgment that will be poured out on the earth. Second, let's think about Noah. Now, as Enoch represents or typifies the translation of the saints before the flood of the judgment of God, Noah represents some other folk. And who does Noah represent? Noah and his family were safe in the ark before the flood. Now this is going to be representative. When you read the seventh chapter of Revelation, and some of them will be able to flee and be spared. But Noah and his family were saved before that awful, that awful wrath of God, judgment of God being poured out on the earth that begins not at the first part of the tribulation period, but in the middle of the week when the Antichrist breaks his covenant with the Jews. And the last three and a half years, that's the awful time of God's wrath. Well, let's look at some others. Let's go to the book of Exodus. Let's think about the firstborn of Israel. Well, I missed one. I forgot one. What about Lot? Now, Lot made some terrible mistakes. He committed some awful sins. His wife became a pillar of salt. And we know some other things that happened in his life that we'll not mention now. That isn't necessary. But before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot was rescued from the wrath of God that was poured out on those cities before the judgment came, right? Right? Then let's go to the firstborn in Israel. The firstborn in Israel were sheltered by blood before the death angel passed over. Twelfth chapter of Exodus. So before the death angel passed, every home where the blood had been applied, the death angel passed over. They were spared. So Israel was safe on the wilderness side of the Red Sea before Pharaoh and his army were buried in the same sea. Folks, that brings us to the remnant according to the election of grace will be saved before the destruction of Jerusalem. Not only are we going to get into that in Revelation, but that's the teaching of Romans chapter 11, and it can't be refuted. And finally, 
the elect of God, all the chosen of God, will be saved before the second coming of Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. Second Peter 3, begin studying with verse 6, if you will, and go through verse 9. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I assure you that every person who has been chosen by God before the world began will be brought to repentance before the second coming of Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm glad that soteriology is not in my hands. I would be the most miserable person in the world if that were true. But it isn't. And I feel sorry for preachers who feel like that because of their failure, people are going to hell because of their failure. I fail and so do you. But not one of God's chosen will die before he has been brought to repentance. And I said brought to repentance. Who do the elders represent? They represent the people of God, both of the Old and New Testament. One statement. Go back to the last two verses of chapter 4. You notice that both of these chapters conclude with worship and praise. They worship the Lord and they praise and give Him the honor that He is due. But let's read the last two verses of chapter 4. And when the living creature shall give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, to the one living forever and ever, the four and twenty elders shall fall down before the one sitting on the throne, and they shall worship the one living forever and ever, and shall cast their crowns before the throne, saying, I like that statement, shall cast their crowns. You know, there are five different crowns that believers receive. We're not discussing those tonight, but five different crowns. What will you and I do if we're fortunate enough to have earned a crown as a Christian? When we stand before the Savior... We'll cast our crown at his feet. He's the one to crown, even with our crowns. It is more wonderful to acknowledge Christ's glory than it is to possess our own. Would you think about that for a moment? I said, it is more wonderful to acknowledge Christ's glory. Now, we're going to have some glory than it is to possess our own. You know, men want to get credit for what they do here. Right? I said, men want to get credit for what they do here in time. But folks, not there. Not when we stand before Christ. We're not concerned about getting credit. Our only concern, folks, is to worship Him, honor Him, 
And we'll do it even by casting our crowns, if we have any, at the feet of him who is worthy. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. I've been redeemed by his blood, so have you. If that doesn't touch people's hearts, we don't have a message, do we? But folks, we've got a message. And I'm not responsible for soteriology. I am responsible for the proclamation of the truth which will enable those who have been quickened by the Spirit of God, thus regenerated, to hear, to grow, become strong, strengthened, edified in the faith. That's all I'm supposed to do. But what a joy it is to study about Him. Let's stand.